which are really uh, disjoint of each other. Uh, they share in the sense that they are both, they share in two properties. One, that they are both dealing with large deviations as a mathematical tool to get where we want. And two, that they are both dealing with things which you can think are connected to statistical physics type questions and random graphs, or graphs, maybe not even random. Uh, part one is what I planned originally to do in lecture two, and will kind of be supplement to what we will do later maybe in lecture five. It is taken from uh, my saver paper with Andrea Montanari. It is section 113 in the beginning of this, uh, of this uh, survey, and I will just essentially go over the essence of this uh, piece of the survey. But it is well-known classical material that was known way before we wrote the survey. In both, in both in physics for sure, many years ago, and in mathematics as well. Part two is uh, this nonlinear large deviation. It, it's a, it's a follow-up of some works of, uh, or connected to some earlier works of Chatterjee alone and with, uh, and with Varadhan. And this specifics was taken from the paper, joint paper we wrote that just appeared in Advances of Mathematics. There is a, the account that I will give you is equivalent to the account that is given in section 10 of Chatterjee's recent survey paper uh, in the archive, which skips all the technical uh, actual calculation. And I will all, also skip all the cal actual calculation. It will be the same, really. But if you want, the difference is this, this section 10 is really cut and paste from our paper, but without the stuff. So let me first do uh, part one. So the Curie-Weiss model is really the easing on the complete graph. Okay. So we are looking at this particular measure, and what this measure will be, it will look like uh, that, right? So we just look at what is the easing measure that we already saw. Um, it's going to look like, so we have G. If we want, we have what is called Kn. And we also have to scale beta to depend on N. And so the measure mu N beta B of X, X belong to minus 1, 1 to the n, right? It's an easy measure. There is a normalizing constant. And what's in the exponent? Well, I claim, let's do the calculation on the side. What should be in the exponent? There should be a sum xi, xj, ij equal 1 to n, maybe i not equal to j, but we are having a complete graph. So every pair is going to be an edge. We should scale by beta. So I'm scaling by multiplying by beta n. The reason is now we have n square edges. We want the overall contribution to be of order n. So we divide beta by n to make sure that it's going to be that size. And then we have a b times the sum of xi i. Right, so this is a Hamiltonian, or our Hamiltonian times beta of H. Just write it like that. Usually, I, sometimes I, I put the beta outside. Here, I don't. This is our Hamiltonian. But, you know, this xi square is always 1, right? xi square is always 1. So up to a constant, which I can anyway incorporate into this Zn, I can just uh, forget this condition. Right? I can just forget this condition, and it only changes by a constant. Okay, but now I'm in better shape because what I have here can be written in terms of x bar. Let me call x bar the average. Let me call x bar the average, and let me rewrite what appears here in terms of x bar. And I claim that what is written here is beta 
over R. This should be probably maybe X less than, okay, maybe something like that. Okay, it depends whether, there is a question whether you count every edge twice or once. If you want to count every edge once, you really should go over I less than J between 1 and N. And then after I remove the not equal and change it to, maybe I do that, like that. Now I do, I change it to, I change it to one, I did a mistake. I change it to one half, ij equal one. Two. Okay. And then what I get, I get beta over two, x bar square plus b x bar all times n. This is just algebra. x bar is, is this divided by n. I multiply back by n is exactly this term. Here, if I add the diagonal terms and take half of all the terms, what I will end up with, I'll just get, I can write the sum of xi times xj. I can just write it as the sum of xi squared. And if I rearrange and put the beta here, I get exactly this. So the end result is the Curie Weiss can be written as follows, n beta over 2 x bar square plus b x bar. So you can see that, uh, that the measure depends on the configuration through exactly one parameter, x bar. Every vector with the same x bar exactly has the same probability. So what we need to do, we need to, we can do large deviations for x bar. x bar cannot take too many values. And what we can write, p x bar equal to m, I claim should be approximately 1 over z n beta b times expectation of n phi of m. And what are the values that m can take? m takes the values minus n over n all the way to n over n. Right? So there are not too many values that m can take. There are about 2n over 1 possible integers divided by n. And I want to calculate what is phi, what is phi of m. And I claim that phi of m is beta over 2m square plus bm plus the relative entropy of 1 plus m over 2. And where is the, what is the relative entropy? This function will appear again. This will be a binary entropy. So not relative entropy, binary entropy. The function h, the binary entropy of p is going to be minus p log p minus 1 minus p log 1 minus p. p is between 0 and 1. Okay, this function, the binary entropy, looks like that. This is h of p, this is p, 0, 1. This is one half, where it is equal to log of two. It's a symmetric function around one half. It's maximal at one half. It's an entropy. Entropy is maximal when you are more or less equal, and it's equal to zero. It's zero at one. Now, where did I get this estimate? This quantity I simply copied from here. These two pieces I simply copied from here. Right? If x bar equal to m, I just plug it here. So where is the approximate? Well, I need to count how many binary vectors have a particular value of x bar. Right? So this comes from, this really comes from the statement. Uh, this is lemma. Uh, this comes to, this, let me write it. So this comes from heavy um, 
number the probability uh, there is the number of minus one one to the n vector of average average equal to n is about Call it H. And how do you do that? This you get by essentially, if you want, Stirling approximation to the binomial. The transformation from the average being equal to m to 1 plus m over 2 is exactly the statement that you, when you move from minus 1, 1 to 0, 1. And what you have here is that you, you ask the question, what is the chance that a binomial will be equal to a particular value? So you can write it as n, choose this value, times 2 to the minus n, and you can work it out. And you put in also the 2 to the n because we actually count instead of looking at probability. And so really this calculation is an approximation of n. This is an approximation of n. Choose n plus 1 over 2. You just do Stirling approximation to all the terms that you find. A, not this. This is multiplied by n. Stirling approximation to this quantity. Okay, so what do we do with this? Yeah, so no, no. Okay, what do we do with this? Well, we can use this uh, nice expression now to analyze the behavior of, uh, of, of this measure, right? First of all, it's uniform over this collection. And now we just need to see what is a, how this behaves. We can also find this z, right? Because there are not too many values of m. The number of m's, number of m's is polynomial in n. In n. So you can approximate, so can approximate, can also approximate the z and beta b. And what we will find is we will find that uh, this is lemma lemma 1 point uh, okay, so this is really lemma 1.2 This probability is a mu, so I didn't write it correctly. This probability is a probability under, uh, under the Curie-Weiss model, under this model. This is called the Curie-Weiss model. Okay, so, so this is lemma, this is lemma, uh, lemma 1.2. Uh, and then, using it, we can move to lemma uh, 1.3, where we can calculate the free for all n large enough. In principle, the free energy, which is 1 over n log the Zn beta b, is approximately 
phi star beta b, and what is phi star beta b? It's a supremum of phi beta b of m over m m minus 1. And this is a phi. We can get the free entropy by the free energy by studying the, this function of one variable from minus one to one. Just plotting it or doing some analysis, uh, calculus to find where the maximum is, and this will tell us where the value of phi star is, but it will not only tell us that, but we know, since we know that the distribution is uniform subject to x bar, we can figure out what are the typical co uh, components. Where, where is this measure going to be for very large value of n? It's going to concentrate around the value of m, x bar will concentrate around the value of m that make maximize this quantity. Okay, so this is lemma uh, 1.3. And then we can do the calculation, and we will arrive at some conclusions. So we now we do calculus. The soup obtained when phi beta b prime of n equal to zero. And this is equal, you just calculate, you just differentiate this function. It's not difficult, quadratic, linear, so it's linear, constant. You have to differentiate this entropy, but it's not very difficult. You just differentiate this function in p. It's not too bad, too bad, too bad. And when you do the algebra, it comes to be at the solution of the equation m equal tangens hyperbolic beta m beta m plus b. So what I did, I simply jump over a step, but I calculated the derivative. So I got the beta m. I got the B, you can see, and the tangents hyperbolic come from differentiating this guy. The antiderivative of this guy will give you this. In principle, I should get beta M plus B. It's come from the fact that H1 plus X over 2 prime is arc tangents hyperbolic of X B to the If I get arc tangent hyperbolic of x, maybe x is not a good uh, letter here. P. Q. Okay, so if you get arc tangent hyperbolic of n equal to beta n plus b, probably there is a minus somewhere. Then you arrive to this one. Okay, so now the question is to draw some pictures that show us how this thing looks, and in particular, how it depends on how does it depend on on beta and b. Okay, so here is a situation. Here is one, and here is minus one. And in the beginning, there is going to be, if beta is small enough, there is going to be only one solution. And if beta, so if we plot the phi, beta b, in the beginning, there is only one solution, maybe something like, like that. It's a monotone function. This is beta small. This is where the maximum is obtained. There is a unique maximizer. But then, when beta becomes large enough, essentially when beta is greater or equal to 1, 
you can have this situation, let's say B equal to zero, then you get complete symmetry and you get uh, maximizer, minimum, maximizer, minimum, everything is symmetric. So you have M star, M minus, and M zero. This is a minimum and two maxima of equal height. And if you take B positive and beta still greater or equal to 1, what you will get is that the maxima at M star will go up because of the B. So this picture corresponds here. B equal to 0. Bit small or less than 1, really. This picture. And here I have the third picture. Where now the max, the first maximum is bigger, the minimum went, is no longer at zero, it moved to be negative, and then there is a smaller, it's not going to zero necessarily, like that, right? So this is my M star, this becomes my M zero, this is my M. Always two maxima and one minima in between, and the largest one is always going to be the dominant one, if I choose B greater or equal to zero. If I choose B opposite, the whole picture will be, will be completely reversed. You can check that changing B, changing M by sign is exactly giving you the same solution. Because the tangent hyperbolic is, a, is an odd function. Okay, so from this, what we conclude is theorem 1.5 four and one point five that says that if beta less equal to one or B positive then for every epsilon positive and for every n large the probability is that X bar minus M star is bigger than epsilon is less equal to 1 minus e to the minus n so Essentially very small. So x bar is going to be concentrated around m star, and our measure is really very close to a uniform measure on a sphere, if you want, or a piece of the, of the hypercube, which have exactly or, pres or almost exactly or precisely around this number m star. It's like a magnetization. So we have a good description of what the easing measure is in that case. This is equation 115 in, uh, in this survey paper. But there is another case which is more, complete, more interesting. If beta is positive and B is 0, bigger than 1 and B is 0, then we have a situation which is now different because now we will concentrate around this one uh, sorry, this was like that. I, must have kept I, I was not doing an upper bound. This is going to be at least a, ah, all my directions. The difference is going to be that in this case, where I have exactly two equal symmetric maximi maximizers, it's not true that the measure is going to concentrate around one of them, but it's going to concentrate equally around each one of them. So each one will get measure about one half minus a small correction term for everybody else around us. And whereas in the other case, they're all concentrated around one. And this brings us to the notion of coexistence. And that's the last theorem I want to to show from this part before we move to, to the second part. Now this, um, this uh, theorem is really easy once you did your calculus, right? I mean, this is just drawing or, or just checking what type of solutions this equation star can have. And I already know that my distribution is just going to be like that up to a constant, right? So if there is one point which dominates, I can calculate 
and the function is very nice, and I don't have too many possible points, I can just bound the probability assigned to everybody whose value is, once this guy is slightly off of n star, I can just check from this picture that the maximum height I will get will be slightly smaller. Everything here is multiplied by n, hence I will get this very small probability. On the other hand, in this case, because of symmetry, it's everything okay, except this guy takes exactly the same amount as that guy, so I'm exactly one half to each. So this theorem is, is just a, an elaboration of the picture that I drew to you, or if you want, counting the number and, st and size of solution of this nonlinear equation, and the nonlinear equation is simply just the calculus of calculating the derivative. So all that we did really was to do this calculation. That's a very simple type of large deviations. And finally, I want to say that Curie-Weiss exhibits, exhibits coexistence if and only if beta is bigger than 1 and b is uh, greater equal to 1 and b is 0. Now I need to plot to you what coexistence means, and the best, uh, the best thing to show it to you is the coexistence is this picture. This is coexistence. Now, what does this picture mean? It means that there exists two sets, omega plus minus, or there exists, if you want, omega plus, which is all the x having the sum xi greater or equal to 0. And then omega minus is omega plus complement, such that the mu n beta b of omega plus minus is greater or equal. I'm just copying what I had there. And the mu n beta b of the boundary epsilon of omega plus minus is going to be. Now, what is boundary epsilon? Boundary epsilon means here I was looking at greater or equal to 0. In the other one, I would look at strictly less. And the boundary epsilon is just uh, all the points whose distance, if you want, or the sum from n to i is going to be uh, less than epsilon. Uh, what do I want to say? This is... Uh, Depends how you do the boundary, but it really doesn't matter for us. If, if you want, you can just make it symmetric, okay? Let me just call it like that. Uh, you just go n epsilon on both sides. And this picture shows you the volume of the measure, that the easing measure mu assigned to these sets. So these sets take a large amount. If you want, the set is up to here. This set also takes a large amount, half. But this tiny, this corridor is relatively large. It has size 2 and epsilon, but it has a tiny mass, right? The mass is tiny. You should think of it like this, a bottleneck. And that's why this is called coexistence, because it suggests that the, the configuration split into two pieces, one corresponding to magnetization M star. Really, I could have shrunk it even more. This is magnetization M star magnetization minus M star, and in between there is a very small probability. And this is very common to, in general, so generally expected of easing. Generally expected of easing, and also in principle of pots, just pots may split, pots split to Q because POTS has a Q-fold symmetry. If you put B equal to zero, it has a Q-fold symmetry of permutations of the, of the different uh, colors. Using has to be. So this is, a, this is ferromagnetic, all ferromagnetic. 
here I already, I already took to ferromagnetic. If I took anti-ferromagnetic, the situation would have been different because here I always took beta positive. I didn't say that, but I always took beta positive. If I take beta negative, it's becoming different and maybe more related to the structure of the graph than I might want to admit. And if you remember, in lecture one, in lecture one, I described the Montanari, Mosel, Sly, and follow-up work with Basak on coexistence, coexistence of easing on tree-like, of easing on tree-like graphs. So in principle, with work, this is also proved this coexistence picture, for example, was proved in the, uh, in the 80s or 90s, was proved for easing on lattices, and more recently, a few years ago, 2010, I think, is this one, or maybe 11, I don't remember, I think 10. It was on the slides for lecture one at the end. This is uh, maybe still in waiting to be published, I don't remember, but it's posted. Um, was proved to tree-like graphs. Now, let me mention one, what makes the Curie Weiss, now that we see the, the, the phenomenology, um, let me ask if there are any questions. Any questions? Okay, so, so this is a general principle of easing and, and other ferromagnetic models that high temperature, nothing exciting happens. Low temperature, you split to the different phases. As I said, it's, it's, suppo it's supposed to hold on many situations. Why was it so easy to do it for, for the Curie Weiss? It was so easy because on the complete graph, from the beginning, we could write the Hamiltonian in terms of one functional. If I could write the Hamiltonian not in terms of one functional, in terms of three functional, it would not be so difficult. I would just do the calculus here over a function of three variables. The problem why I cannot do such easy calculation on a lattice or on tree-like graphs is because once the graph is far from the complete graph, it is no longer true that the measure is almost uniform except for few parameters, and I can just do the calculus on a few parameters. Specifically, I also cannot do this kind of large deviation analysis where I get so nice explicit results, so nice bounds because I'm not directly doing that. I'm using different schemes. So, for example, in this case, the, the idea is to look at the possible measures on the tree. That's what we discussed in lecture three. And the measures on the tree were corresponding to free measure, the free corresponding to M0 plus measure corresponding to M star and minus measure corresponding to M minus. And you saw why indeed somehow the M minus and M plus are, are, are playing a role, but once you put the positive magnetic field, somehow the M minus is removed and on the graph you can just go from, if you want, from here to here and that was where we had the monotonicity and so on that helped us in lecture three. So the tools are very different. So in general, Statistical physicists will consider the problem trivial if you can do it using large deviations. Rightly so. However, if you can do it using large deviation, you get the best possible result, right? You got yourself the exponential tail. You understand exactly where everything is. You can do even finer asymptotics. So you are really in control of doing, getting anything you want out of this problem. And generally, you will even be able to do large deviations, usually even in the cases where are more complicated, not on the complete graph, if the beta parameter is very small. But if the beta parameter is large and you are having more involved calculations, like in the spin glass models or in uh, sparse graphs or on lattices, large deviations usually goes down the tube. And you have to use some other tools. Asking for too much that you cannot uh, get. Okay, so this was uh, an easy calculation 
but to give us a feeling what we would expect from ferromagnetic models in terms not only the, and notice another thing is that we really aimed at calculating the partition function, but there was a principle, right? If the partition function can be written as a variational problem, then figuring out who maximizes a variational problem usually will tell you where the measure concentrate, which is really what you wanted. You never wanted to calculate, who wants to calculate normalization constant just to calculate normalization constant? The whole point why physicists are insisting on calculating them because there are all sorts of parameters in and they expect to get a variational problem and they expect that the solution of variational problem will tell them where the measure is in the limit, which is what you really want to know. And that's exactly what happened here. And that's exactly what we kind of did in lecture three for the, for the problem with the, for calculating the BISA, the BISA prediction, except there we knew how to do maybe this part, but we really didn't know how to do this part because we really did not have large deviation. We were calculating this thing somehow in a kind of roundabout approach, so it did not give us anything except a normalization course. But it gave us supporting evidence where to look the support of the measure. Any questions before I go to the second topic? Kind of run on your updates, uh, you said there is a replica symmetry breaking, so. Not for easing. Ah, not for? Not for ferromagnetic easing or pots. They are still adhering to this picture. That's ferromagnetic models tend to be simple because if you want, in a ferromagnetic model, you know what the ground state is before you start. That was said. You can actually solve the beta equal infinity easily because the maximizing configuration is kind of obvious from the start. Whereas in the cases where there are frustrations and conflicts, it becomes harder and harder for people to decide what to do not to draw on any uh, recent events. And, um, and as a result, uh, it's complicated. And somewhat unexpected too. Okay. So now I want to go to another topic which shares that we are going to do again large deviations, kind of large deviations. The difference will be that this large deviation that we did here was relatively easy. It fits the framework of, it fits the framework of Varadan's theorem, if Varadan's theory, if you want, Varadan's theory, or classical large deviations. You can call what we did here large deviation principle and so on and so forth. And derivation was very similar to the standard way, except it was so elementary it didn't need to do much because everything was discrete and I could do binomial approximation. But in principle, what I did, I expressed the measure in terms of some approximate statistics and bro broke it into not exponentially large number of possibilities for which I have a good approximation. And I did the normalization constant as a soup, something called Varadan's lemma. In contrast, the next thing which I will do is also going to be a large deviation analysis, but it will not adhere to this technique. That's what I said. It's a nonlinear large deviation analysis. It also is applicable for problems on sparse graphs, let's say erdos rheny graphs, but it is not necessarily about statistical physics. Actually, it's not about statistical physics. The motivation and the type of result. Nonlinear large deviations. So what do we want to solve here? We have a function a real valued function which is twice continuous differentiable on in the boundary of our set with um, 
derivatives extending continuously to the boundary. So it's a function on which we can do calculus. And we define partial derivatives. They just will appear a lot of things. So let me just use short notations. Fi is the first partial derivative, the vector of gradients. Fij is the second partial derivative vector. And suppose we have some control on them. Suppose we have... on various terms A, which is the sup norm of F, Bi, which is the sup norm of Fi, and Cij, which is the sup norm of Fij. And I will call this smoothness. Meaning at the end of the day, when I write a theorem, in a theorem will appear all sorts of A's, B's, and C's, and N's, and I hope that whatever appears in the theorem is going to be small. So let's assume that all of these terms are not too big. As well, we also have another information on the complexity of the gradient vector, right? The gradient vector is simply this vector, fi, for the corners. So x, 0, 1 to z. And what is the complexity? What is this complexity? It means that for every epsilon, there exists some set d epsilon a finite subset of vectors in Rn which is sub-exponential size. This is sub-exponential size. So if you want the 1 over n log of the size of d epsilon, which d epsilon depend on n here, uh, is going to be small, such that it's a good approximation of the gradient vector. What does it mean? For every x on the corner, for every corner point, I can find some vector d, d1 to dn. This is a vector in my approximating set, such that the error in L2 between fi of x and di is less equal to epsilon squared. Okay, so this is a set. Again, I have, a, I have a, set, a function that has two properties. Property number one, I have control on the function up to second derivative, maybe uniform control. In property number two, on the corners of the cube, I can, if I write the gradient on the corner, I have two to the n different gradients. So the whole game is, of course, if you let me use d epsilon whose size is two to the n, I will be trivially done because I will just choose for d epsilon these vectors. There are only two to the n vectors to consider. I will just put all of them in there and get zero error. I claim that for even, I'm assuming that this function, somehow this gradient function is not too complicated in the sense that I can approximate it by much less than 2 to the n ter different vectors. Somehow there are many x's, 2 to the n different x's here, but maybe the gradient doesn't take too many values, or almost doesn't take too many values, or many values of the gradient are too close to each other, I can replace them by one vector d. Okay, now what do I want to do? I want to approximate some quantity which de de involves the value of the function of, on the corners. Okay. 
So our goal is to approximate, so I'm going to talk about theorem 1.6. <coughs> we want to approximate, and this is theorem 1.6 in my paper with Shurav, and it is also theorem, I think it's 10, is there a 10.1 or 10.2? I'm sure I'll serve a paper. I think two. One, not interesting. For those people who take the notes, let me just write. No, 10.1. chapter Okay, so what do we want to approximate? We want to approximate something that looks like a partition function, but without the normalization. F, which is a log of the sum over x in the corner e to the f of x. And how do we want to approximate it? And I'm just going to tell you how I'm going to approximate it. As f star, which is a soup over x from 0, 1 to the n, f of x minus i of x plus lower order terms which are complexity plus smoothness. These complexity terms will involve d epsilon. They involve really n epsilon and the log of d epsilon. Involve n epsilon and log d epsilon. And these smoothness will involve a dr. And I did not say what is i of x. i of x is, or i of u, right, i of u is the sum, i of x is the sum of i of x i. It's a bit uh, bad notation. Maybe I should call it like that, i like this, so it will become clear. These two lines. This is a vector here. Okay, this is a vector. And what is i of xi? i of u is minus h of u of the previous story. So it's minus u log u minus 1 minus u a plus 3. might have made a mistake in the sign somewhere. Let me just check before I try to prove it. Just check that I don't have a typo. I always have typos with this sign. I is with a plus. If I is with a plus, you put a minus. So if I is with a plus, then you put minus. Good. OK, so I did not. Yes. When you say log of uh, d epsilon, d epsilon is a, like a subset. It's a Sorry? Right d, d of epsilon is a, a subset. A, a size. Size. It's a size. Okay, so let's see what we are trying to do. So the goal is pretty ambitious, right? So we take a, any pro function on the corners of the cube, any function, right? Looks like that. I mean, if we can succeed. And then we will try to calculate this log of the sum. Why do we want to approximate? It's kind of obvious. There are two to the n different terms in this sum. It's very difficult to calculate such a sum. Right? It's exactly, it's more general than our all the, if we can solve this problem, we can solve all the problem of statistical physics as a special case. Yes, it's quite ambitious. Of course, not all f 
not all, you know, we can always write something like that. I will write you always something like that. But so often, these terms will be bigger than this term, right? Kind of the statement of the theorem says, my error is smaller than my main term. If not, fail. Now, this is a very interesting approximation. It looks exactly like what we did in the Curie Weiss. It's a classical large deviation approximation. I said, look, just replace, put here f of x, and assign to each x approximate probability e to the minus i of x. And then just take the maximum instead of taking the log of the sum. Now, the problem with this argument is twofold. One, we have, we cannot do it individually on each one. Two, notice that we also moved from the corners into the, into the inside. But in the original problem here, the value of f inside was never specified. So you could imagine giving me a function on the corners, and I decide what to do inside. Now, if I can decide what to do inside, I can make big changes to this guy. Now, where are my hands kind of forced? My hands are kind of forced. I can even make my gradient at the corner close to zero by simply not doing too much in the corner. But it's this second derivative that means that I meet, must meet my, uh, like miss, meet your maker at some point, right? I can cheat on the corners, on all the corners, but at some point you will catch me. If the function is very complicated, I try to go with zero gradients, at some point, I will need to take a big second derivative to match all these directions. So if I can need to, co co to keep the co smoothness honest, then I cannot cheat too much inside. And then this condition on having a small gradient is meaningful. So the gradient is really not on the point. The gradient is including the directions inside. And then, of course, the question number one is, how do you get such a theorem? And specifically, what do you stick here? Right? What ex you know, more precisely, what is going to sit here? And secondly, well, you want a theorem that at least has few applications? Of course, I can put here uh, 2n or something like that, and 2a, and then the theorem will always work. But it will all be completely useless, because this has no chance of being bigger than my error term. OK. Uh, any questions? So you can have two boundary values of f at 0 and 1, and you can always make linear interpolation. Is it better to make the other interpolation? Uh, you can make, but uh, not on n direct, not on. You need to meet your. Uh, you come on all the core. It's not a linear. The whole point here is dimension n goes to infinity. The whole issue is when n goes to infinity. This is not an interesting theorem in four in any finite number of dimensions. The goal is, really the goal is this f should grow. I didn't divide by n because sometimes this is not even growing like n, but some other function of n. But this is supposed to grow with n. You capture, supposed to capture here the leading term as a function of n, and you hope that these things will be smaller as function of n. And I will give examples where this was done. So the goal is also to find a good, as you say, interpolation of f inside. That is true. The good point of Ryok is that in principle, you gave me only f of the boundary, and there are many different ways to extend it inside, except that in the examples we know, somehow f comes very naturally. You know, If f is like a sum of x, i, x, j, you would expect to just do it also inside. Why change, why put something strange inside? So usually, in many of the examples I know of, the f somehow comes already in a natural form, meaning it's on the corner, but it comes with a, such a small, nice formula that you are tempted to use exactly this one. But it's right that maybe there are some other known less trivial extensions which will do better. So what kind of example do you have in mind? I, I'm sure you will explain later. I did not explain anything yet. Are you are sure that I will explain? I'm hoping that I will explain, but it's a good idea that I will explain the examples, maybe, because then there is a chance that I will not get to the proof. There's not a chance that I will not get to the explain the examples. Um, maybe, uh, okay. So let me explain the examples. That's a good idea. Um, 
Okay, so first, let me write here application with quotation mark, because application with quotation mark is not really an application, but it is theorem 1, 1 in our paper. And this is as follows. You have Y, which is Bernoulli. Bernoulli. P. IID. And you want to check that the log of P of G of Y is greater or equal to Tn is approximately phi p minus phi p of t minus delta And in principle, this complexity and smoothness term will be a replica of the complexity and smoothness terms that come here, but there are just going to be more of them. But what, how do I connect this problem to the previous problem? The difference is here I no longer, here I did some calculation of a log of a sum, and here I'm doing a log of a probability for Bernoulli random variables. Now, my Bernoulli random variables do not mean that this is not a difficult problem because it's a very complicated function of the y1 to yn. So the fact that they are Bernoulli is great, but I cannot do uh, very much with it. And what is a phi p? What is phi p of t? What do you expect? So it's again, it's this kind of Varadan principle. What you are going to do, you are going to take the minimum of i p x over all possible x in the inside of the cube such that g of x is greater or equal to tn and ip of x is the sum i equal 1 to n ip of xi IP of U is a binary entropy, relative entropy between two Bernoulli's. This function is also called in the large aviation literature the, cool, the relative entropy. Entropy. There should be a minus, yeah, there is a minus, which is no negative and is minimal, this is just a comment, minimal zero when u is equal to p. It's like a measure of difference between two different Bernoulli, Bernoulli u and Bernoulli p. It's your reference measure. Think of changing the Bernoulli's here to new Bernoulli's. This quantity is exactly calculating uh, the rate function. That is, what is the cost? of changing all these Bernoulli's p to different Bernoulli's xi, maybe not the same i, maybe not the same parameter. And what you are doing, you are doing, you're taking overall, you take the change among all the possibilities that exceeds the threshold, you are going to take the one that has the least cost of changing these Bernoulli's to these parameters. That is a principle of large deviations, and we hope that our problem G here, that the function G is such that these complexity and smoothness terms are not going to be smaller than the leading term, which is what we would expect to have. And this delta is simply giving us some room to massage the problem a little bit. Now, what is the connection between this? So I will actually prove to you, I will prove to you the, less, the upper bound, because the upper bound is a challenging part, not the lower bound. You almost kind of saw how I achieve the lower bound. I'm simply changing my Bernoulli's to, vel to Bernoulli's xi. This is exactly the Radonikodim derivative, what is written here. 
and I just choose the one which does the job. And then I pay the cost, and that's what I get. So the lower bound, I don't even need all these terms. But in the upper bound, I need, I'm going to go through a procedure. I will invent a smooth function f of x, which is For the lower bound. I mean, I'm asking what's the statement. <laughs> ah, the statement is not written. There will be some smoothness and complexity yeah, terms, and, and they will involve a delta in them. And they will involve an epsilon in them. And the epsilon will depend on the delta and will come from this smoothness and complexity term. I'm just trying to check how you get from this theorem to this theorem. And then I will give this finally the answer to Takashi's question what are the real applications? I am going there. But this is a general principle also important in large deviations. You simply approximate the indicator by a function which is 1 or e to the minus m. m is very large. And in our case, you need it to be smooth. So you find a smooth function f, which is 0 if g is greater or equal to tn, and is minus fm if gx is less than t minus delta n, hence, see, hence here is my problem. I need it to be smooth. I cannot jump and apply, and apply theorem 1.6. And so whatever sits here will be whatever comes from here. So if you want, this is my function. Now let's write what my function e to the f is going to be. Well, my function e to the f will be 1. This is g. If I exceed tn, it will be very small number, e to the minus mn. You can make it small enough that it will not bother you if you are below t minus delta n. And then you do something here in between. And the something you do in between, you are trying to shrink this as possible, like uh, Ryoki wants me to do. But you're trying to make the first and second derivative to be as least harmful to you as I want to do. And you want to make this guy very small so it will not bother your calculation of the indicator. And obviously, all these three goals are conflicting to each other somehow. So you massage it so it will work. And this is actually delta prime, I think. And delta prime is not exactly equal to delta. I don't remember why, but, uh, but it doesn't really, not that important. So the point is, and this is a classical uh, strategy in large deviations, is there is also a similar classical strategy in, uh, in proving central limit theorem or weak convergence, which is it's much better to work with continuous or differentiable functions than working with indicators. So in case of need, you replace indicators by smooth functions that approximate them. And that's what we do. In a central limit theorem, usually you take uh, nice bump functions and prove some, some limit result for them. That's essentially Lindenberg uh, method to, to prove the classical central limit theorem. The difficulty in large deviation is that you need this to be 1, but you need this to be extremely close to 0, and you want this to be relatively small, and you don't want to pay a lot, so it's much more uh, tricky, which is why the smoothness, and if you read this theory, if you read this paper, you will see that the smoothness and complexity terms here resemble those here, but they are even much uglier. And that's why there is no point in going over the proof of this theorem because it simply sends you to the other one anyway. Okay, now come real applications. Right? Okay, so the real applications I have are two classes of applications. One, and I will go over more, mostly on one, which is counting subgraphs of a sparse graph, random graph, random sparse Erdos-Renyi graph counting how many graphs have a certain number of subgraphs. Specifically, so you want to count, you want to count the number of sparse graphs, but counting the number is the same as counting the, if you want, is exactly the same as the counting the, the probability sparse graphs, and here it will be G, which is Erdos Reni G N P N. 
where Pn goes to zero. Not too fast. And if I want to be uh, if I want to be honest, I will say almost embarrassingly slow. Is a honest way of saying not too fast because it's going to be much slower than needed. But which kind of sparse graphs having having a certain unusual unusual unusually high number of subgraphs subgraph H counts and most importantly find or alternatively if you want find the large deviation rate function for Here is an example, and this is theorem 1.4 of the same paper. Also, you can find it in sure of the survey paper, x greater or equal u x minus psi p u. One again goes to infinity. This function is explicit function, nice short function depending on what is x. And x here specifically x is t h g and u is bigger than one. Okay, so what do I need in order to explain what happens here? Okay, so I need to explain, I'm not going to explain <coughs> this, it's written in the paper. It's really an application of this thing. The specific problem at hand. What is this thing? I explain, it's just has some number, some rate, which goes to, to inf n to infinity. The Pn is the probability of my Erdos-Renyi. It should go to zero, not too fast. And what is Thg? Thg is a number of uh, number of appearances of appearances of H within G. Example, if I take H to be, let me, uh, actually I don't need this probably, so I'm going to erase it. Any questions about this application before it disappears? No? Okay. okay. So let me explain what... Uh, let me explain what, uh, what uh, example of THG. So if you take H to be this, then THG is the size of EG. You count how many edges you find in your graph. If H is this picture, then THG is the number of triangles So what's the point here? You take an Erdos-Renyi graph of a large size n, and you ask, what is the chance that such an Erdos-Renyi graph will produce a number of edges? That's trivial, actually. This is, this is the only case which is really trivial, because the number of edges is IID. It's the sum of IID. This is just a binomial. You don't need my help there. Um, uh, this one is harder, because the triangle, this triangle involves three edges, and they are... Different triangles share in the same edges. So you're asking, 
what is the chance that we have an Erdos-Rheny graph with a particular parameter Pn that has a, a, a big, bigger than usual, that's this U bigger than one. We do this large deviation only in one side. We don't know how to do the other side. It's very different uh, strategies and proofs. What's the chance that for large n, the number will exceed its mean by a factor, two, or 1.1? Now, you can, people have before did this calculation in the sense that they know the rate in which this goes to zero, but here you get the explicit rate function, the constant in front. You don't get correction term, but you get the constant in front. Uh, what is easy to do in these cases, it is easy to compute uh, the expectation of x, right? It's an example. If h is triangle, it's going to be n choose 3, n choose 3 times p and q, right? Very easy to do that. You count how many triangles can be there, and you calculate the probability that each one of them will be 1, will be there, right? The edges are independent. Each triangle involves three edges. There are n choose 3 ways to choose 3 out of n. You can do that. It's not so difficult, actually pretty easy. Pretty easy to do law of large numbers, meaning to calc to check that x over e of x converge to 1 when n goes to infinity. It's harder but possible to do central limit theorem. Possible to do central limit theorem. Of course, in order to do that, you start wanting, for this, of course, you want e of x already to go to infinity. You cannot do a law of large numbers or central limit theorem where the actual expected number is uh, half because there's a round variable is integer. And for central limit theorem, it's even harder. But it's possible to do central limit theorem. And the trick is to use Chenstein method. It's worked like, like, it's worked like beautifully. You have here a sum of indicators, right? lots of them. And you can use a method to do Poisson approximation. There are, of course, overlaps, but there are not too many overlaps. So this will work very well, give you a Poisson approximation. Poisson with a large parameter, lambda n, let's call it lambda n. Poisson with a large parameter can be normalized to become normal. No problem. The trick is not to use methods which are geared towards time series because there is no time series here. Because they are not organized on the line. It is also possible, but even harder, to get uh, the right tail. The right tail. This was done about 10 years ago. 10 years ago. By uh, Chatterjee, among others. Johnson. And a few other people. Uh, Vu and Kim, I think, uh, Kim and Vu. This was kind of the rage in the, maybe more even, 10, about 10 years ago, slightly more, 10 plus years ago. And then the question was how to do the large deviations. And this was done more recently, after all of these things, uh, by uh, Chatterjee and Varadhan when P was constant. Chatterjee and Varadhan did a large deviation when P and is P bounded below. When P is constant, there is a theory of developed in the last uh, 10 years by Lovac and other people of graph limit. You can use this theory, combine it with classical tools of large deviations, and together they give you a very satisfactory result in the sense that they give you the rate function, the one you would expect, the one that was predicted before uh, there was a, I, I made a conjecture when Shura was a PhD student, I made a conjecture and told him that this is his goal to solve before he left Stanford. He left Stanford, went to Berkeley, went to MIT, went to, Cornell, to Courant, met Varadhan and together they managed to solve my exercise. I was very proud. So the moral is always give good exercises to students, one they can carry with them for many years and if they are successful they will solve it. So anyway, but the sparse graphs is even harder. 
because the classical methods of large deviations are never going to touch it. And the reason is that for the, the principle of Shura Varadan, Chatterjee Varadan, was based, as I said, on graph, graph limits or on graphon theory. Graphon or graph limit. And graphon of graph limit is based on Semeradi regularity theorem. And Semeradi regularity theorem, when you try to do it on sparse graphs, completely drops dead on you, really. So you, you can do something, but it's so poor quantitatively that nothing will recover from that. You need a different idea. It's not going to work this way, even though the formula that you expect at the end is very similar to the formula, as you saw, is a classical form. I erased it, but the classical formula of large version coming from here. It just says, look, just do what you would have done if you were very naive. Physicists call this a naive mean field approximation. Why naive? Not that it's naive to prove it. Not that it's naive that it holds. But it's a, what the first thing you will try to do if you are looking for a simple answer. You said, well, I will replace this by taking probability to each element and then replace the sum and the log by the maximum. That's kind of the simplest variational problem. The variational problem doesn't appear anything that you wouldn't expect. No Parisi formula, no PDE, no object that was not there already on the problem. Okay, let's do a, a break and I will go over the essence of the proof in, uh, in, uh, ah, let me say one more thing. Okay, let me say one more thing, and then we have a break. One more thing. Two, actually, two. The, this theorem, if you want, combination, combination of Chatterjee, Dembo, theorem 1.4 plus analysis of psi pn u i batacharya ganguli Lubetsky and Zhao is what gives you the right answer. So what we get eventually is a rate function, but if you remember, the rate function involves a sum over n terms. What um, Batacharya, Ganguly, Lubetsky, and Zhao, and Zhao do, did, they use the graphon limit theory as a tool to help them analyze the rate function and found a very simple explicit formula for this psi. So we have explicit, they have simple explicit, which is much better, like a, a one line. Now, the reason this is very good is because it's, this is also telling you, as we said, the max, this variational problem or the maximizer tell you roughly how you would expect the sparse graph to look. There are, because, but because they are using analysis on our calculation, if you want, of normalization term, we don't, we are at the same position that I mentioned about this in lecture three, that we don't really know how to prove that conditional on being such, the graph would look like that. We believe that strongly, but we cannot prove it. That is one. And two, another application is the same principle for counting arithmetic progression. Counting arithmetic progressions of fixed lengths K uh, in random Bernoulli subset of Z minus uh, in Z. So you take the integer modulo n, so it gives you a nice uh, circle, large circle. You choose a subset randomly, Bernoulli, 
sparse set, so Pn is the probability of choosing an element there. You get a sparse set. Now the question is how many arithmetic progression of length 3 you can find there. You can see this is also a very difficult, even more difficult, um, even more difficult uh, Bernoulli function, you know, Boolean function or Bernoulli function, but fun counting function. But it's the same analysis. This arithmetic progression adhere to the same principle. Of course, in the second step, it's no longer analysis of graphs, but it's now using Gower's powers to get this thing. In our paper, we just do find the same principle, and we don't analyze the rate function. But Acharya and Sri Ganguly and two other people replace, no. Acharya, Ganguly, Zhao, and one person replacing Lubetsky did this analysis using Gower's powers. You know? So you need now to use uh, arithmetic, uh, uh, arithmetic combinatorics, you know, number theory and stuff like that, because it's a different function. So the first step is coming from a different theorem in our paper different application. Okay, so now a break finally, and we will continue at the uh, four for uh, whatever. So let me go over the proof of the upper bound because the proof of the lower bound is really uh, easy. And you don't know, think I have time for both of them. So if you want to read the proof of the lower bound, you can read it yourself. It's really almost done by Okay, so what we are going to do, first we are going to define a random vector x, which is So, um, so the proof of the, we will go over the proof of the upper bound, and we will start by defining a vector x, which is a random vector from 0, 1 to the n, which is distributed according to our target function. Okay, so it's actually having a PDF. Okay, this is a finite, this is just a finite space, so it's not nothing... Uh, Nothing fancy about that. So we have the distribution function of this is exactly that. The e to the minus f normalize it exactly to the total mass one. Exactly the same expression. Okay. That is the number one item. Number two item, we will define now x hat i of x as we go over x on the cube. And it is given as follows. It's an expectation of this random variable xi, conditioned on knowing all the other variables. So you give me a configuration on the cube. I throw out one element, and I replace it by the value of the expected value of this vector, this coordinate, when I use this distribution. So let me write to you what this is. This is going to be e to the f x i 1 divided by e to the f x i 1 plus e to the f x i 0. And you can guess what my... Uh, Maybe I should write it in the opposite, actually. I wanted to write it like that. Zero i and one i. 
And what do I mean by x1i? Well, x1i is x1 up to xi minus 1, 1, xi plus 1. It's a vector where I replace one coordinate, and given a vector here, I just replace one coordinate by either 0 or 1, and I check what is the mass of this divided by the sum. That's exactly what I get from this guy. I can also write it if I want is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus delta i fx. And you can guess what delta i fx is. Delta i fx is the f of x 1, 1 here, uh, 1, 1 or 0. Now I forgot which one. Uh, minus, it's probably 1, right? One minus f zero. This is kind of like approximate, discrete approximation for the ice gradient. And I change from one to zero, and I will call this function u of delta i of x. And what do we know about u? We know that u delta i of f, no matter what x you put there, is a function between 0 and 1, right? It's 1 over 1 plus something. And you can even easily calculate the derivative of u and see that it's less equal to a 4. So it's not a bad function. OK. And we are still not done. This is just preparing all sorts of notation. We will define the vector x hat. And the vector x hat simply collect the x hat 1, x hat 2, up to x hat n. So what is x hat doing? It is mapping the corner of the cube to the inside of the cube. That is probably going to be a big element of our calculation, right? Remember that in the f star, we should go somehow from the corner to the inside. That's the way we go from the corner to the inside. We use these conditional, conditional expectations to find an inner point. Okay, now comes plane number one, which is kind of the crucial element of the whole thing. Now, there are really two planes which are the crucial element of the whole group. One which is difficult, which is one, and two which is easy, which is two. In plane one is when we collect all the error points. So what my goal is to do now is to replace what appears in F star to somehow some try to get between F and F star. So try to approximate this F in terms of certain things. This F and this I in terms of something involving the, 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 the F star. Claim one that with high probability, X belong to a good set A. And what characterizes a good set A? The good set A has two properties, where F of X is not too far from F of X hat of X. That is property A. So this move from X to X hat, I didn't ever say that X hat is very close to X. This is not true. But I said that somehow the choice is this f here is making the value of f of x hat not too far from f of x. So the target function is not changed too much. And property B is that the function g, g of x hat x hat, again x hat of x, which is also i hat is not too far from g of x, x hat of x. And all my error terms are going to sit in these two wiggles. This is where I collect 
my complexity, my smoothness term. This is where smoothness will come. Now, I did not yet define those g's, and here is g, g of x, y, is going to be, uh, is going to be the sum from i equal 1 to n, x i log y i plus 1 minus You can see, first, you can two, see two things about G, which are important to know. One, what I just wrote, the G of X hat X hat is I of X hat, because when you plug X equal to Y, that was exactly the definition of I. So if you want, doing F minus I in this approximation is exactly the same as managing to move to F of X hat of X minus g of x hat x hat of x. And the second thing, why did I like this second approximation, is because this g is a complicated function of y, but it's a linear function of x. An exponential of linear functions, I can sum even over the hypercube. Easily. Almost easily. OK, so this is claim one, and I will probably not get to prove it, but maybe we'll see. Then, okay, by definition of A, we have that the sum e to the f of x, x on A, divided to e to the f, is approximately 1. Because that's exactly this. What is this high probability x of equal to A? What is the probability of x equal to A? It's exactly this quantity. Because remember how x was chosen. x was chosen according to this distribution function. So being in A means what? Means summing this over A. This means that. So the conclusion of this is so that we write what I conclude after this lemma. First of all, f is a log of the sum of the probability of x equal to y. Is what I wrote here. But then, because of a and b, I can replace the f of x by this quantity. And I can also add the difference between these two because it's very close to 0. So I can write the log of the sum of the x and k of e to the psi x. And what is psi? Psi of x y. Psi of x y is um, is f of y minus r of y plus g of x. Again, the, the y was the second argument, not the one on which I sum. It's approximation. Here is f of y, pay from here, replace on that. And then I took this difference. I took the difference in this one and that one. I replaced this one by that one. So it's I of y, and I have gx1. And I need only to sum it over x. Now, the point is that if you notice, this is a piecewise, this is a Linear, but this one is linear because different x 
values might give me different x hat. But if there is only one x hat, it will be a linear approximation, because the function is linear. If there are two, well, it's going to be only two pieces. If there aren't too many pieces, I can control what I do. Step one was to replace big F by F hat. And step two, to work on F hat using the complexity. So using same size. That's good, not too big. Uh, for vectors, P Now, if you want to guess what will be the P, the P is going to be the U of the DI. Remember, we have this function U, and what sits in is a gradient, the discrete approximation of the gradient. So what I'm doing, I have a good approximation D of the gradient. This is an integral over the gradient. The function has a nice derivative. It's a lip sheet. It's bounded. Everything is nice. So I will just push my approximants through this function and use them to try to approximate these results, which are u of the delta f. It's not very difficult to do. This is actually a relatively simple step. These guys are, as I said, are approximation of the gradient of f. Now you can worry that when you do this discrete gradient, you go through the inside, but because of the smoothness, the control on the boundary should transfer with some a bit more smoothness to the control on the inside. So the gradient doesn't change too much if you have control on the second derivative. Okay, so now, let us define the set of x in 0 to the n such that you know x half of x is nearly and this will be for every p in our population. So instead of going over the cube, I am, I'm supposed to go over the corners of the cube if you remember supposed to go over the corners of the cube, the subset of the corners of the cube. So instead, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go over my not too many approximants to these values. And for every approximate, I will sum over all the x's, which give me x hat, which is nearly p. That's the idea. OK, so now. I 
from ready to uh, to do another bound by replacing my f hat with a more more uh, big bound. Okay, so f hat is going to be less equal to the log. I will sum over all the things in the side. I will sum over I will put here e to the f. Let me write now explicitly what my psi was. I just replaced the psi that was sitting here. I just replaced the psi that was sitting here by, by the explicit value of the psi. The three terms and hold the x up inside. And I also forgot completely about the A. It's just going to make it bigger. I mean, upper bound. So just sum over everybody. And I break my sum into two groups. And I'm going to do this sum inside sum first. So as I mentioned, using the approximation. Well, since under this condition, x hat is close to p, I will write f of p minus i of p plus g of x. And now, you see, the p will go out. This will go out. This piece will go out of my calculation. I will be left by the, the sum over x in pp of this type. And I claim that the sum over x even on all of 0, 1 of e to the g xp, that is claimed to, which is actually crucial but very simple, is 1. That is the beauty of linear functions. That's exactly why I did all this manipulation to arrive into a linear function here. So the whole point is the whole calculation, really. At some point, I get to something that I can sum over the, over the unit cube. If there was another function you can sum over the unit cube, then you can do better approximations. Now, given claim 2, you can keep rounding it. And what would you get? You will get the law. I will just replace this by the overall sum, which is a subset of the truth. Now I don't care. This was serving the goal of simplifying. Once you simplify, I take the larger set, and I get only one. So I get the log of the sum over p in d prime epsilon e to the f p minus i of p. But this is going to be less equal to the log of d prime epsilon in size, just a number, plus f star. I just replace this second term. I took the maximum value here, which I called f star, took it out of the sum in the log, and just represent how many terms I have. And I assume that this is small, right? This is my this is my main complexity term. So as soon as this log of the D epsilon is smaller than F star, I might be in business. I would be in business, except I collected all sorts of things in all my wiggles. Where did I collect things? I collected things here and here. And one more time. Uh, this I did not really collect another one because it was the first one, but I think I collected one more. Uh, I didn't collect much, but maybe there was a change. No, I didn't collect anything else. I collected all my smoothness terms in claim one, and I had to add to pay this cost in claim two. Uh, after claim two at the end. Okay, so what is left is to prove claim, uh, claim two and to write to you the theorem. 
And of course, I did not prove claim one, but it's uh, not a different uh, exercise in uh, certain exercise in calculus. Now, before I do that, let me point out to you one of the strengths and the weaknesses of this, of this method. The strength of this method is we never really ask too much about the function. Did you see anything specific about the function? No, you didn't. So we kind of fly blind. We don't care what the function is. We do this in piecewise linear approximation. If it works, we are very happy. What is the negative part about this approach is what I just said is the positive part about this approach. Since we don't ask too much about the function, it's possible that we give a lot. But we shouldn't because we don't care what the function is. Now, where is the main limitation of the, f of the problem? One of the main limitations is that we insist on getting at the end to a linear function of x. So no matter what function you started here, we try to get at the end to a linear function. This kind of limits the way we can approximate it. And why do we want linear function? Because the linear function is the only function that I can, ca that I can calculate on the, on the, on the, if you find another class of functions, good class of functions with parameters that you can sum over the cube, then you should re 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 quickly read this paper and write another paper before you read it. Because you are surely going to do it slightly better if you have a bigger general, more general. As I mentioned, at the end of the day, we can probably... In most, I believe that in most cases where well, the answer is that this approximation F star works, this method will produce it. But it will not necessarily produce it for sets as sparse as it should do. Because here and there you give away a lot. It's like using some wrong Cauchy Schwarz in the middle of your proof, and you give something. And then, yeah, you got something, but you did get the optimal. So one of my students tried very hard to, to do it under optimal conditions. But, uh, he improved what we did, but uh, he's a very good student, so it's quite difficult. Otherwise, it's not necessary. <laughs> he, he succeeded doing other things, <laughs> which are hard. Okay, we also try. I would not want to say about myself, but Shurov is very good. Okay, so let me just uh, proof of claim two. And you will read the proof of claim one uh, if you want from uh, both of these papers there. Uh, it is, uh, it's especially in the paper we wrote, it's certainly written. Okay, so just proof of claim two is very easy. Let's just do it. So what are we doing? Let me try for G. Is here with G? I'm just going to sum. Uh, Xi. Right, that's what I wanted to do, right? Okay, that's really easy. What do we have here? Is the sum over x, which is 0, 1, to the n, or I'm just going to write what is written here, which is going to be a product from i to n, uh, yi to the x, uh, yi to the x, i, 1 minus y, 1 minus y. What you recognize is that this is just the probability of independent Bernoulli Bernoulli to one i equal to the vector x. If you sum over all possible vectors, the product of Bernoulli is obviously the real one. I think it's a very nice way to finish the talk on a high note, something with no wiggle, and why I wrote P. Ah. 
I will give my notes to the people who take the notes, so hopefully, and they also have the references, so hopefully at the end you will get a slightly better version than what you got. one word about how to do the lower bound, which is pretty really easy. Um, in the lower bound, you simply do a Radonicodim, uh, a Radonicodim type T. You already see from here what is kind of the principle here. And so you do a Radonicodim theorem, and you replace F by F minus G plus G, and you use some Jensen, and you get the lower one. It's, it's, a, it's a two line. And you collect very few terms. Most of the terms you collected because, you know, to do this approximation, the,